you always have to be looking for the light and the darkness can kind of show you where it's coming from. You're not there where the light is, but you know where, you know in what direction it is and you can kind of orient your spirit in that direction. And, you know, I guess some people would, that's like the definition of hope, really. Mark Arelli, welcome to the See Through Podcast. Hey, it's great to be here. Thanks, Lance. Yeah, I'm very excited to talk to you. You uh, have a new album coming out on February 3rd. So I'm very excited to have you on to talk about your new album and kind of your whole story with uh, retinitis pigmentosa. It's an interesting story that I I think it's going to be really good to cover because I think me and you will connect a lot on being in that kind of middle ground yeah. of vision loss with, with with how RP affects us. Yep. But uh, I think before we start diving into conversation, I'd like to give you a chance to uh, introduce yourself to those listening who are new to you. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, my name is Mark Arelli. I'm a singer, songwriter, uh, sideman, musician, producer, uh, kind of been doing that independently since my debut record in 1999. This will be my 13th record uh, under my own name coming out. So been been doing it a while and been been doing a lot of different things. 13. Yeah, lucky 13. <laughs> and yeah, you know, I was diagnosed uh, a couple of years ago, kind of in the fall of the first year of the pandemic. I added this journey on top of that journey uh, of how the pandemic was already affecting yeah. affecting my job. So it's it's been a wild ride the last couple of years. Yeah, definitely. It's it seems like life today versus life when you were diagnosed in the fall of 2020 is like a night and day kind of uh, experience for for how people are living and and let's talk about that a little bit. Um, so in the fall of 2020, you were diagnosed. With RP. Yes. But like you said, you've been doing music for, you know, since, you know, 1999, I believe, right? Yep. Yep. And, um, you know, I've never been, I'm not a, I'm a morning person. I'm not, I'm not a night person. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I've never been great driving at night. I've never really been good, like staying awake after the gig at night. You know, now in retrospect, I wonder if some of that was my brain trying to make sense of the information that it was or wasn't getting from my eyes. Yeah. You can compensate, I think, with with low level you know vision loss for a long time. Uh your brain thankfully is very plastic in that way. And yeah. um I think as it gets worse, you know, that that process of compensation maybe can be more and more tiresome. And that that might have been some of what I was feeling uh, at night when I would just be exhausted. Um, But um, yeah, I know I kind of had moments like that where looking back before like RP, before I would say I was noticing symptoms. When I actually look back, I realized I actually was experiencing symptoms before I thought I was experiencing symptoms. Yeah. You know, uh, and I feel like as time goes on, the more you'll start to connect the dots. Like, this is why I did this that way. This is why I always, <clears throat> you know, find myself running into people more than other people or tripping over things more than other people. And, yeah, you know, and I, I want to talk about how you kind of started to notice or at least one of the big landmark moments for you is when you were playing live. Yeah, it was pretty dramatic. Um, it was... In uh, late summer 2020, yeah. and um, we were doing two shows at this place in New Hampshire where we were performing outside because no one was vaccinated yet. Yeah. And um, the first show was great. It was like bright sun and went really well. And uh, we went uh, went in for the set break and came back out at 8 o'clock. And it was like, I was like, wow, it's getting dark early, you know? And I got up to the stage and, you know, we started playing and it just felt really, really dark. <laughs> um, certainly compared to the to the bright sunlight of, of uh, the earlier show. Yeah. And I made it through, you know, several, several songs just fine. But um, uh, at one point I was supposed to, you know, take a guitar solo and I went and looked down at the guitar neck to try and see where my hand was. And I couldn't see any of the markings on the side of the guitar neck, you know, um, most guitar necks have, 
dots. Uh, well, here, these dots along the side of the of the the neck that tell you where the frets are, yeah. what frets you're on. And I couldn't see that. I couldn't see the frets. I couldn't really even see my hands where they were, what strings they were on. And then this is all in the middle of a song mm. in, in the space of like, a, you know, a few tenths of a second where I'm supposed to like step on a pedal and yeah. get ready to rip a solo, you know? And I just couldn't, it was totally disorienting. And of course, you know, it was, it was clam chowder. It was just, it was, I, I just didn't really play well at all. I was making mistakes left and right. Um, and it was very unsettling. That's very unlike me. And, um, it just took me out of the performance really yeah. for the rest of the gig. It happened one or two other times to a lesser extent because I, I got really conservative in how I was playing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I just remember thinking like, this is really weird, you know? And after the gig, we realized that I had set up in front of the stage, uh, because we were all socially distancing, even the band, you know, they yeah. were in masks even outside and, we were six feet apart from each other and I'd set up in front of the stage where the lights hadn't ever been focused, mm -hmm. you know, and it was daylight when we'd first loaded in. So, um, even that night I thought, well, I just, I just set up outside the lights and I didn't realize yeah. it, you know, like next time note to self, make sure the lights are shining on you, you know? And I just chalked it up to, a kind of a pandemic fluke. But then a, a couple of weeks later I was driving through Boston and uh, again, since it was the pandemic there, there wasn't uh, any real traffic on the road, which is very uncharacteristic for, yeah. for Boston. And uh, I was driving along the Charles river and there's these small uh, short tunnels uh, on Storo drive. And I went down into the, to the tunnel and I just lost the road for, mm -hmm. you know, it was just a wall of darkness it seemed like forever. It was probably a second or two, you know, yeah. but, um, there were no taillights in front of me to, to guide mm -hmm. me into where other cars were. And, um, thank God there was no one behind me cause I, I unhelpfully slammed on my brakes and, yeah. and someone would have just rear ended me. So that was when I was like, okay, something's no. not right. You know, I've and had I moments it, like that yeah. too, driving when, I quit driving when I was 27. Okay. And uh, I, I, I had moments like that where if I was in unfamiliar territory and it, it was like, not, you know, it's it's kind of hard too when you're trying to navigate with like your phone's like GPS and then you're looking at a bright screen and then you look up ahead and then it's like your eyes don't yeah. adjust and then you can't see where you need a turn and you miss a turn and then it's like this dark country road. You know, I, I was living in North Carolina yeah. So yeah, if, if I missed a turn, it would, you know, sometimes these roads were just like zero <laughs> street lights and yeah. I just got uncomfortable driving or, or cars would appear in front of me out of nowhere, you know, cause they just got, they were right. in that blind spot and then they, they merged into my lane and then I'm like, Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, m people are such horrible drivers in Boston that maybe, maybe I didn't notice it for a little longer. You yeah. know, everyone kind of drives like they're half blind here, but, um, <laughs> You know, I just thought I needed glasses. Yeah, and uh, and I went and I did need glasses, and I and I got the glasses. But the look sharp, by the way. Thanks, thank you. Likewise, <laughs> but um, but the the woman, uh, the optometrist said, you know, there's there's some irregularities on your your retina, and you should get yeah. checked out by a specialist. And and that's when I found out. Yeah, I, I was doing some digging on you, and it, I read that your mom has retinitis pigmentosa. She does. Yeah. Um, and I didn't, you know, I don't know if this is willful ignorance or what, but mm -hmm. I just didn't know that it was her like heredity. I thought it was this weird freak thing. Yeah. It was just hers, you know, it's um, a weird freak thing that replicates. <laughs> yeah. Once it starts, you know, it, that's yeah. what's so, uh, that kind of ironic about it. it is it's, it's a rare disease, but once you have it, it just gets cycled over and over again, but sure. And yeah. it's like anything rare that, you know, that you don't know exists. You don't, you're not aware of how prevalent it is. And yeah. then once you know what you're looking for or what, you know, what it is, it, you start to recognize it all around you, you know? Yeah. So then I started to think back of some other people in our family, you know, that 
I had never been super close with, but I had known that, that, uh, they had eye issues and, you know, to me, they were just, they were older, much older people. I just thought that like, well, they're, they're old. They, that's why they can't see, you know, yeah. but it turns out that, that, you know, RP had been in our family and I just wasn't aware of, of the extent. And, you know, that's, that's probably on me. I should have, uh, especially as I'm a, I'm a biologist in training, but, um, I just, it just seemed like this kind of freak thing, um, that my mom had. Yeah. I wouldn't be too hard on yourself for that. Cause I even knew I had RP and I pretended I didn't have it. <laughs> <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. I understand that impulse. Yeah. Cause you know, I had it when I was, I was told I had it when I was 12 because my mom uh-huh. has RP and they wanted to keep close look on me. But like, I didn't really start experiencing any really symptoms like I was telling you about to my early twenties. Yeah. So wow. it's like I, my whole childhood and college, you know, life, you know, I, I just, you know, I studied film, like, <laughs> you know, I picked like a very visual heavy career. I just was like, no, no I'm just going to pretend like, you know, it's, it's not, uh, going to affect me. And t- to be honest, it's, it worked out for me. I'm kind of glad I, I kind of disregarded it and kind of just, just forging my own path with it. But, you know, now as I'm facing symptoms, you know, I'm starting to connect the dots, like I said, where I'm remembering certain things. And I remember being on a yeah. beach with like a meteor shower and everyone was like, ooh, and and on. And I'm like, what are they? What, what are, where are these at? meteors? <laughs> at? You know, so that's kind of yeah. when I figured it out. But um, hmm. yeah, those those moments of kind of where the light bulb, you know, it's not like it's it's registering like a good idea, but it's. It's regist- registering something's off. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It, yeah, it goes off and then the light bulb blinds you. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah it's, and it's you chalk it up to a us. fluke. You know, that's what you were calling it, a fluke. And I've done that so many times too. It was like, oh, if I run into someone, I'm in a bar. Uh, I had Maybe I've had too many drinks. If it, oh, this road's just super dark. There's not enough light for me to see it. You know, right. you, you, you can kind of trick yourself, you know. Yeah, and you know, and, and my mom's stuff kind of all came on. Uh, in earnest after I had left the house and gone off to college and, you know, went off to, to kind of live my, my life on my own. So yeah. I, I didn't really see as much of it early on. Um, and so, you know, it wasn't at the top of my, you know, my, my potential, uh, you know, list of, of scenarios like, like it might've been. Um, but so, yeah, I, I know a little bit about what it, what's in store. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's in some ways helpful in some ways terrifying, you know? <laughs> yeah. I'm in the same pl- place as you, you know, and, uh, where I have symptoms of RP. I'm definitely, you know, don't, like I said, I don't drive anymore. You know, I, I have, you know, struggles in dark settings, but there's some days where I, my vision's so, so I guess I'll use the word good for lack of mm-hmm. a better word, my vision's so good that I, I sometimes I forget I have RP, which, yeah. you, you know, is strange because I've talked to so many people with RP that, you know, that would be impossible for them. Right. Know? Well, it's, it's contextual, right? Yeah. It's, it's, uh, extremely contextual, not just where you are in the progression of the disease, but at any given point, <laughs> excuse me, um, you know, the, the, the contextuality of it for me is one of the hardest parts. Yeah. I under, you know, kind of flat daylight conditions with my mm-hmm. glasses on, I have 20, 20 vision. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. probably better than it had been for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just that when I get into darkness, uh, it's really dark and that, you know, with me, that's, that's the problem. You know, my work conditions are, Mm -hmm. dark 75 to 80 percent dark and it's not just that i feel like legally blind in some of those cases like i just feel like it's lights out yeah blind like i you know coming off stage into Mm -hmm. a darkened backstage if there's not a light there if there's not someone there to kind of tell me that i'm gonna run into something yeah i'm just walking into darkness Mm -hmm. you know and i and uh so for me it's like 
the contextuality is something that I feel really every day, almost, you know, you probably recognize the same thing. Every time you walk into a room, you know, it's like, I can see fine in here. And then I turn this way so that the light's coming from a slightly different way and I can't see anything. Yeah. You know? And, uh, so you start to kind of develop little tricks, right? You sit with your back to the window, you mm -hmm. know, so that yeah. you, you can, uh, you know, kind of see the light as it comes from behind you. Oh, definitely. On other things. Yeah. yeah. These little tricks you learn as you go and, you know, and that has to be hard with these music venues because you're, you're, you're going on tour and each venue has a different layout, you know, random set of stairs here. Yeah. You know, random microphone stand here, you know, guitar equipment here and then back room, yeah. green rooms, you know, like for me, I work from home here and you know, it, I know my layout, but mm -hmm. for you going on tour, you're constantly faced with these new layouts and environments and, and they're, and they're usually very dark, you know, these shows. And, yeah. And I bet you when you're on stage and you're playing, like you're well lit and you can see your hands, so you probably don't see the crowd, I, I would imagine. No, no. Yeah. Some, and sometimes the lighting, as you know, it's, it's, it's not just the amount of light or darkness, it's the, it's the change, you know, the relative change between the two. So I might be looking out at where I suspect the audience is yeah. and there's bright lights shining in my face. And I might be rel relatively well adjusted to that. And then I look down to look at my guitar and it may be very challenging to see things yeah, um, because of the, the change in uh, the, the amount of light. So, you know, I'm just constantly looking for solutions to problems that, uh, you know, that sometimes I don't realize I, I'm encountering until I'm, you know, it's in the middle of a gig, but like now on every mic stand, I'll have a little, uh, like, a, a music stand light that I clip to my vocal mic stand and it shines down onto my, below my eyes, onto my guitar neck so that I know that if I need to see my guitar neck, there's at least one spot on the stage where I can always hold my guitar and I'll be able to see what I need to do. Yeah. You know, do you uh, explain that at all to the, to audiences or does it go unnoticed, you know? I don't, I'm still learning how to talk about it on stage Yeah, because, you know, when you tell, you know, cause you've been doing people, this for, you know, two, two decades, Yeah, you know, touring, you're, you're, you're like a true legitimate professional musician, solo musician you've toured with, you know, and collaborated with Grammy award winning artists. Like, you, you know, this isn't your first rodeo, you know? No. So, so it, it, it's like, I'm imagining you, you've been doing it for so long. You probably feel like you had it on, you've had, you know, touring and performing on lock. You, you feel like, and then now you get this RP curveball and then you're learning, you know, these new, you, these new uh, techniques, you know, put it in a light on your stand. And yeah, it ha has that been a challenge to adapt your performance around RP or, or had, is that a challenge that some, sometimes you enjoy a challenge? Is that a challenge that you enjoy or is that one that you're kind of a little bit uh, irritated at, you know? Uh, I, I still get frustrated a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I have to, I'm, I'm still constantly working on that whole, like you just, just take, take the present moment. Like you can't see it's not, it's not necessarily bad or good. It's just, yeah. this is the way it is, you know? Um, but I get, <laughs> I get frust frustrated all the time. Yeah. Um, and you know, my goal for performing is I want the complete absence of conscious thought. Mm, yeah. I don't want to think about what lyrics coming next. Mm -hmm. I don't want to think about what I'm doing on the guitar. Yeah. I want to be plugged into something uh -huh. infinite and unknowable, you yeah. know, like that's what I'm trying to do. Uh -huh. I don't, you don't always get there, but that's, you know, that's my religion, right? Yeah. So if I look down and I can't see the guitar or I'm blinded by a light, mm. it takes you out. It takes me out of the yeah. moment and you know, yeah, it's not really like a big deal in the, in the big scheme of things, but it is a big deal if I try to walk off stage and I walk off the edge of something, you yeah. know? So, um, so I, every, all of these, uh, little tricks that I, that I kind of do the light on the mic stand, I've got, um, I've got all my guitar stands have this spiked, the spike tape on it Yeah. because this, this 
this uh, where the guitar neck rests when it's um, not in use, that's black. And I'm turning around and I go to put my guitar in there and I can't see where to yeah. put the guitar in, you know? So stuff stuff like that, all, all those little things I do, I try to do in advance um, or I try to take care of them as I encounter them so that the next time I don't have to think about where I hang my guitar up. Yeah. Or I don't have to think about how to see my, my guitar neck. And I can try and stay in the moment as much as possible, mm-hmm. you know? So it, it has been a, a real adjustment and it's, it's not one I always, I, that I handle like yeah. gracefully every time for sure. Yeah. I've done, um, a few, I played a few open mics before, you know, and, oh, nice. uh, and it's definitely not nothing, you know, to be like bragging about, but you know, I gave it a shot a few couple of times and, and even those little open mics, I, uh, would get there early and kind of look at where the stairs are and you know the microphone and and I if I got too far from the microphone sometimes I would have a hard time getting back to the microphone because I wouldn't know where I was at and I just kind of decided to stay put and I was just like it it kind of like took me out of it and then also when you're really nervous because you never do it you're 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 doing what you're talking about thinking of the lyrics that are (laughs) coming up and sure and then by the time the song's over I was just like happy that I just got through it yep and that's when I kind of realized I was like, maybe this isn't for me. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> it's yeah, hard, I mean, man. It's hard. I th- maybe if I'd known this was going to be my lot uh, years ago, I would have stuck with at least a better lit pr- uh, profession. But you know, I, it, this is what I do, and I, and I'm, I f- I feel like I have to fight to do it every day, even before I was diagnosed, like as an independent artist, like Mm -hmm. there's not some huge company bankrolling everything I do. And I don't have a ton of people driving me around in a tour bus and setting up all my gear. You know, I, it's me. Yeah. And, um, from a lot of years that was only me. Now I have, you know, I have a, a manager, which is great, but, um, yeah, it's just, I'm stubborn. You know, I've been fighting for my profession daily for 20 something years to, to just kind of survive at it. Yeah. And in some ways that serves me well with the RP because it's like, all right, well, I'm not, this is not stopping me, you know, at least not until it absolutely has to. I don't Um, think it will, man. Yeah, I, I, I don't either, really. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that, that I want to highlight here is that, you know, I, I was so open with it because I just felt like I was going to need other people's help. Yeah. And that's very, it's very hard for me to admit. I, I like to take care of my own stuff, right? I'm the same way. But yeah, so it's hard to know that you're going to be dependent at some level on some on other people. And, you know, before, like when I was out there with my band on stage or something, or if I'm traveling around with the side man, you know, they've got my back musically and that's, yeah. that's not nothing for sure. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. But now well, the people that I travel with, like the, I, my safety is like literally in their hands. Yeah. You know? Um, and so to a person, everybody in my professional life has been so amazing. I mean, if I, yeah, if I talk about it too much, I'll, I'll get really, really emotional mm-hmm. about it, but everyone's been so supportive and all the time I'm telling myself, like, if they told you the same thing that you're telling them, you would do the same thing. And, and I, and I hope, I hope that I would, but mm-hmm. the, the support and the love and the care that people have given me and, and that, that allows me to keep doing what I'm doing, uh, has been invaluable. Uh, and I feel very great, grateful for that. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, beautiful to hear. And uh, I love hearing that. And I was going to ask you about that because not only have you had to adapt yourself performing, but you know, I, you know, you've been doing this, you know, this is your career people you've toured with have to see this new side of you, you know, that maybe, you know, RP wasn't affecting you when, when you first started, you know, playing or touring together. And now it's like something new and and that's kind of awkward in itself. And I find that to be extremely awkward for me personally, like some great friends from high school. If I see them now 
and we're doing anything at nighttime and I'm moving slower, it just feels weird because I never had to do that before. Yeah. And now they have to see me in that way. And it's, and it's like, I know it's more, I, I, I can't quite tell if I blow it up bigger than it is. But it's like seems re- like it seems really big to me that they notice it, but I don't know if that's actually true in their perspective. Like you know, it, yeah, it's yeah, a really big personal hurdle for me is to kind of just like you said, just kind of put yourself out there. Like I do it with this podcast, you know, but there's still people in my personal life who it's brand new to and and. It's like when I can see well in this room and then I can't see well in that room, it's like I even get in my own head about, oh, am I, do they think I'm like milking, you know, like uh, my vision loss? Am I, am I exaggerating it, you know? And it's, right. and it's like, right. that's the last thing I ever want to come off as is exaggerating, you know, my vision loss. But it's like, there's, there's a middle ground or there's like, it's a hard thing to navigate when you you want to be open about you know rp and how it's affecting your vision but you also don't want to like paint yourself as a victim or as a hey everyone feel bad for me kind of thing you know and it yep yeah absolutely so it's like how do you how do you tell people without coming off that way and it takes a lot of effort and uh yeah it sure does yeah i mean if you were if you or i were walking around with a cane Yep. Um, <laughs> you know, that would be a very different way to present to, you know, both the people that know you and people that, that don't know you, mm-hmm. um, you know, having, you know, a quote unquote invisible disability, yeah. it's this weird tension that you have to hold pretty much all the time you're in public where you have this thing that you don't want to be defined by, you know, I want people to think of me as Mark, the musician or the artist or who, you know, whatever I'm doing, not, not Mark, the partially blind guy, depending on the lighting conditions. However, you know, you have to let people know because they can't, they can't see what you're, you know, you're struggling with. Yeah. So you're in this constant position of having to advocate for yourself while at the same time, every time you talk about it, you feel like, you know, it's, it's, you're maybe letting it define you a little bit more mm-hmm. than you're comfortable with. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's something that I, I struggle with too. And I, you know, I wonder, I wonder what people see. I think, you know, if I were to knock over somebody's guitar, they would, they would think a lot about it, but I'm not sure if they, they think a lot about it as much about, you know, I'm thinking about me. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure other people are, you know, mm-hmm. like, um, in terms of feeling awkward, but, uh, yeah, it is, it, it's, it's an odd thing even just to know, like how it took me forever to use the, the D word, you know, the dis- disability. Oh, like, yeah. I just thought like, well, I'm not disabled enough mm-hmm. yet. You know, I'm not in a wheelchair. Yeah. I'm not using a cane, you know? And one of the most amazing things about being open about this is that other musicians, other artists, even my audience, have opened up to me in very, you know, it's heavy a lot of the times about the stuff that they're struggling with. Yeah. And it's sometimes it's things that, you know, you could kind of see if you're looking for it, but oftentimes it's not, you know, whether it's having, you know, uh, family members that, that have, um, uh, you know, severe mental health challenges or mental health challenges yourself. You can't tell if someone's, you know, kind of struggling with that kind of stuff. So my point is everyone is dealing with, it seems like something. Definitely. You know? Yeah, definitely. And I think the, the tendency sometimes is for us to think, well, it's only me and I've got to figure out a way to minimize it or control for it. And, um, you know, that's a, that's a lot of pressure to put on yourself. And I have found that by being open about it, um, other people are more open with me and it makes us, it brings us together more, you know, because we realize that yeah. this is part of our shared humanity, right? Like, yeah, it's like since you opened up, perfect. they feel comfortable to open up, to, you know, to you and yeah. yeah. And you have to be prepared to 
hold that space with them. You know, I can't go around telling everybody I have RP. And then when someone wants to share something with me, I can't be like, I got to go. You know, yeah, yeah. I have to, you know, if I'm tired or whatever, I have to, I have to find a little bit of space for that person who's in that moment is being just as brave as I, you know, I might've had to be at, at some point. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I know, I know where you're coming from and I, I agree with that perspective completely. Um, I think what happens sometimes too is, you know, I'll focus so much on my RP that I forget that I have a bunch of other problems too. <laughs> you know, it's like, you still have all the, your regular problems. You still have, you know, you still gotta be, I still have to try to be a good, you know, husband, brother, you know, son, yeah. friend, you know, dog parent, <laughs> Yes. you know? So it's yeah. like, uh, you, you still got all these other responsibilities. You got, uh, you gotta be a good co, uh, coworker or just employee. You gotta pay your bills. And, and then it's, you know, sometimes it's like, it's, I feel like having a disability on top of all that is just, uh, sometimes can be like the straw, you know, that, that breaks the camel's back. Sure. And, uh, so yeah, it definitely adds like a, another obstacle to an already existing obstacle course of life, you know, cause life's pretty unpredictable and hard. You just, just with, with or without a disability, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I feel like what it does is it makes that, that layer, that extra layer of challenge yeah, kind of visible to you. Uh -huh. Um, or, you know, that you can experience it in a way that sometimes when we're younger or, you know, and we feel invincible that we feel like we can kind of just blow through it, you know, but it's always there. Yeah. Um, if it's not there for us, then it's there for someone else we're interacting with. And if we aren't sensitive to that and we might not see it and we might have an awkward or, or, you know, kind of insensitive interaction with someone where we didn't kind of see all of them, you know, or acknowledge all of them. Um, and, uh, so yeah, it's, I, I People have said, you know, I've read a lot about like, well, some someday, you know, you'll you'll feel grateful for your disability, and I, I you know, I'm not I'm not at that point yeah. yet. But what what I what I will say is that it has given me a more multi dimensional appreciation for just how much everybody is trying to carry all the time, yeah, yeah. and. I'd like to think it's made me a lot more patient with other people. Um, I'd like to think that at some point it will make me more patient with myself. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this is like what, this is what therapy's for, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then working on all that stuff that you were talking about. Yeah. Um, but you know, it, it, it does, it has helped in some ways it's kind of op ironically opened my eyes uh, a, yeah. a lot. Um, and I Definitely. am, I'm grateful for that. Yeah. That's something to be grateful of. I think, you know, it's just, uh, there's definitely nothing wrong with being more empathetic and patient with other people and being able to put yourself in other people's shoes and, you know, uh, but that's kind of, I, I agree with what you said. It's, it's like, I, sometimes I find it easier to be empathetic for others more so than myself. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm my own worst uh, critic, you know. Right, right. Yeah, I mean that's where the the songwriting thing really helps because, you know, it's it's basically my job. I mean, yeah, I'm a musician, I'm a singer, whatever. My my job description really consists of like, pay attention, and be empathetic. You know, yeah. because, you know, when you're writing a song, not every song is about me. Sometimes I'm writing songs about other, mm -hmm. other characters, you know, other people that may exist or just people that I made up. And you're always trying to walk in their shoes in the context of the song, you know? And so if you had asked me before all this, I would have said like, I'm a fairly observant, empathetic guy, yeah. you know? Um, and I have to be because my job requires it of me to mm -hmm. do, to do it well. But I just think that my empathy and my observation have gained um, 
you know, uh, added dimensions from learning this about myself. And I'm, I'm curious to see how that translates into the art, you know, mm-hmm. like at, uh, I don't, I don't know if I would have mentioned any of this stuff to people because it is personal. Yeah. Um, if it what if it wasn't, if it hadn't been going to affect how I, how I do my art, like being mm-hmm. able to get to the place where I do my art and it started getting into the songs yeah, in very, uh, overt and in very, you know, metaphorical ways too, uh, more subtle. So, you know, once it became part of the songs, I was like, well, I'm going to be talking about these songs. How do I not talk about where, where that stuff, what inspired that particular passage, you know? Yeah. Um, so that's, that's when I started to really realize that I had to, I had to talk about it because it was, it was in the art already. And, uh, and, and that's not going to stop. Yeah. I think, uh, that's a good cue to talk about your new album coming out, lay your darkness down. <laughs> yeah. Um, which, uh, you started writing, you know, after being diagnosed, um, and, you have a very, there's a lot, lot to unpack with your new album because there's a lot, there's a, it has a really amazing story behind it. You know, for starters, you kind of, after being diagnosed to kind of feel, you wanted to feel more in control. So you, you kind of decided, all right, I'm going to record all this myself and ma- build out a home studio. Yeah. And uh, you kind of meticulously kind of recorded every instrument for the album and then um, I, I believe later in the process, you brought in some studio musicians on, I think, the rhythm section, I believe. Yeah, the rhythm section, you know, but at first it's like, and you were young when you were diagnosed, so maybe you didn't have this, but maybe yeah. you came came to it later. But there's, there's uh, once it hits you what's what's going on and what's going to happen eventually, and that you have no idea how long that's going to take... Um, I think it's normal to have like to have some pretty catastrophic thinking yeah. tendencies, you know. Um, I've and, thought every bad yeah. thought, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, you got to get them out there. Yeah. Um, well, thinking doesn't necessarily get them out there. Talking about it yeah. does, but but yeah, I mean, it was. I think both myself and my wife, uh, though I don't want to speak too much for her you know, we, we went to a pretty catastrophic place post diagnosis and, you know, my personal place was, you know, how am I going to be an effective father? Am I going to be able to help support my family? Mm -hmm. Uh, and then like my job is traveling the world and I'm in new environments all the time. How am I going to be able to go work in a new recording studio and not know that I'm going to knock shit over or, yeah. You know, uh, so I, you know, I just felt like I needed to re- regain some kind of creative agency that I had kind of signed away with that sort of catastrophic mindset you yeah. know, in, in the wake of my diagnosis. And so I came down here to my, my studio and, you know, you can't really, well, you can see how far the wall is behind me. It's mm-hmm. the walls are that far away all around. It's very small. It's, you know, 10 by 12 maybe. Yeah. And it's packed full of, of stuff. Um, so the, the actual floor space here is, is probably five by five and there's a big full, you know, there's a big office chair in the middle of it and I can kind of swivel around and all the mics are kind of set up and I can kind of plug things in and be, be working, you know, almost at the speed of inspiration is kind of how I wanted to do it. That's awesome. And I came, yeah. And I, I came down here and I was just like, can I make this work? Yeah. Can I make this sound like music? Um, cause most of the stuff that I'd done previously uh, is getting a bunch of musicians in a room and pressing record and you capture the moment, you know, mm-hmm. and you try and try and bottle the lightning to a certain extent, you know, um, this approach that I was doing down here, as opposed to everything happening simultaneously, it was happening sequentially. So I, I would work on the drums first and then I would work on the, you know, maybe an acoustic guitar rhythm and then I would add a vocal in, you know, on top of that so that, so that I knew where the vocal was and I didn't step on that with any of the other parts. And then I just start kind of filling things out one instrument at a time. And the first three or four or five songs that I did like that felt like exercises. They didn't feel, 
you know, they sounded fine, but yeah. they didn't, they didn't make me feel anything other. All I could feel was like, oh, I should have done this differently with that mic or whatever. Mm-hmm. But I remember there was a song where I played it back at the, after I was finished tracking it and I just kind of teared up a little bit. I got a little emotional and I was thinking about what I was expressing in the song. I wasn't thinking about the mic technique or mm-hmm. the engineering or any of that. And I was like, oh, I just made music by myself. <laughs> You know, I didn't know that I, I knew that I could do guitar and vocal by myself. I do that all the time, but I made the whole band, you know? And once I realized that that was possible, I got fairly obsessed by it because I felt like, well, this is my way to kind of beat back that catastrophic mindset. You know, I can, it's, I'm not going to be prevented from doing this. Yes. There may be some things that I can't do and places that I can't get to, but I can do it here and I can do it very well here. Mm -hmm. And I can do it in a way that feels meaningful to me and hopefully meaningful to others. And, uh, you know, so that was months and months of, you know, almost daily recording. Um, And just as you work through your emotions (laughs) and realize that, you know, it's not quite as catastrophic as you had originally envisioned. You Mm -hmm. know, you're not, you're not alone. Yeah, You're not in the darkness. There's always a light. There's always somebody that you can call or that you can turn to. Um, well, kind of, I, you know, I, I've, for those listening, I've had the opportunity to listen to Mark's uh, new album. And it's a, it's a beautiful album. Uh, super crisp and clean production. Great uh, songwriting and lyrics all around. Great oh, album. Thanks, Definitely uh, check it out when it's out February 3rd. But yeah, that, that kind of remind me uh, of a lyric I think it's my favorite song off the album was Fuel for the Fire. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, that was my personal favorite. But it's like the lyric was, uh, you can't live in in fear, but you can use it as fuel for the fire. You can't live in fear, but you can use it as fuel for the fire. Yeah, you know, and that, yeah, that's kind of yeah. what it reminds me of. Is like, you know, it, that kind of uh, RP kind of supercharged you to kind of try something new, and then once you pulled it off, it felt like a huge victory, you know. And and it's Absolutely. like, and it, it's it's those moments that kind of make you realize, okay, you know, I'll I'll have to explore, I will have to try things differently, but maybe I just need to think about something in a little different way than I'm used to doing it. And, yep. uh, and, and then you have these small victories, you know, a victory of mine Absolutely. is, you know, starting this podcast. I'm able to do this, you know, here in my, in my bedroom. So like, that's a win, you know? So, yeah. And when I learned about your podcast, I mean, I was newly diagnosed and, yeah. um, I think my wife found it somehow. I'm not sure how, but, uh, she, she told me about it and I was listening to it. I forget. It was a, another filmmaker episode. I'm not sure which one. Shared in uh, O'Donnell, I believe. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. That was the one. And the stuff that you guys were talking about were things that I had experienced, but I'd never heard anyone say. Uh, And my wife noticed it too. It was stuff that she'd noticed and Mm -hmm. hadn't heard anyone say. It was incredibly powerful. And it's, it's that thing. Once you, once you get into the art, whatever your art is, um, if you're doing it right, you start to realize that you're not quite so alone. Yeah. You know, and like for me, that was the point where I brought in the rhythm section. I was like, well, I have a band. Yeah. yeah. Like, why don't I get, why don't I, I mean, I can play drums. Okay. And I can, I can play bass, but I'm not a bassist and I'm not a drummer. Like, why don't I get those guys to come in and just play on, play over my parts. And, uh, and in that way, it kind of, the, the, the making of the record kind of mirrored that process of me realizing that like, okay, I felt very alone. Mm-hmm. at the beginning and I did everything alone. But then as I realized that gradually realized that I wasn't quite so isolated, I started to let other things in. Um, I still played most of the stuff on the record, but you know, it's a better record for having brought in, um, you know, my buddies to, to, to play on it. Yeah. No, I think that's, that's exciting. The fact that you're able to, to do it all yourself. And then, 
you had the option, you know, to kind of put these you know, pitch, uh, hitters in, you know, who, who can hit these home runs. You know? <laughs> yeah. You know? I mean, it was still the pandemic too, you yeah. know? So like, I mean, we were all masked in the studio and it, you know, testing before we got, I mean, it was just, yeah. it felt very apocalyptic. And that, Not, see that, that in itself going back to being taken out of the moment that, you know, yeah. having to do all that, you know, you want, you want to just be making music and connecting and then you're, you know, yeah. The pandemic, I'm sure, was super hard on uh, musicians everywhere. Oh yeah, that's an entirely yeah other podcast we can do <laughs> for sure. <laughs> but yeah. um, but yeah, you know, it was it was something that compounded that initial isolation, and it was and it wasn't this that wasn't something I was like imagining. It was that like that was what needed to to happen, you know. Yeah. Like so, uh, to you know, to protect the people you love. So as soon as we could to kind of find a way to be together. Um, that was, that was also something that let me realize like, okay, well I could bring in a couple other people to help out with this. There would still be plenty of me and my experience in it, but, um, mm -hmm. it would actually be more accurately reflective of the way my life is, which is I, I'm surrounded by, you know, a lot yeah. of support. Um, so it felt really good to, to kind of uh, mute my drum tracks and mute my bass and, you know, they're there if I ever want to hear how, you know, they're, that they're not as quite as good as what we did mm -hmm. in the, with the other guys. But, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm really proud that they were able to join me on the record and, and support me there. Yeah, that's amazing. And I also want to talk about, you know, you have your, your, your musician friends backing you up, but you also had you know, amazing fan base backing you up. You raised over $85,000 on Kickstarter. Yeah. <laughs> That's a massive, <laughs> yeah, that was, massive that amount was of money. That was incredible. Then. Yeah. And I, for, I, I now forget the, the amount we were even looking for. I think I, I, I was looking at it earlier. I think it was like you were, at, you were trying to raise 35,000, I think. Yeah. <laughs> you know, which is a lot of money. That's a I mean, lot. 35,000 is a lot of money. And I had done several Kickstarters before, so I knew that I could, I could do one. Um, but I thought, well, this, this is a really big, you know, kind of gamble here. Um, being this vulnerable and open with, with my, my audience. And I said to my manager, you know, this is sometimes they fund in one day. Like yeah. I've heard that happening. It's not, it's not common, but I was like, if people really connect with this, it could really happen very quickly, you know, like maybe a few days or maybe inside of a week or something like that. Yeah. You know, it's a month long campaign. It literally funded in just under 12 hours. Woo. And I, I mean, that was one of the most insane days of my life. Just watching all this very tangible expression of support. Yeah. You know, by people I knew, but then by people that I, I didn't know. Um, and part of that Kickstarter um, story is, you know, you were opening up about RP, mm -hmm. which probably made you feel really nervous because, you know, oh, you're yeah. new to it and it's 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 a brand new feeling to ex kind of expose yourself that way to your fan base who, who, you know, has been following you for years and then now you present them with this and you're like, how are they going to react to it? And then... You, you, and then they do that, yeah. you know? Yeah. I mean, it was, it was incredibly humbling. I mean, you know, I'm a, I'm kind of like more in the folk scene. Like there's, there's a lot of access between me and my audience. You know, I put out an, a monthly email newsletter. Anyone that replies to that newsletter, it goes right to me. I'll write back to people. Like I'm not this. I'm Where can not like, people sign up for your newsletter? Oh, uh, at, at my website, which is just okay. markarelli.com. I'll have um, a link in the, uh, Show oh, description great. if people want to join his newsletter. Yeah, yeah. And that's, you know, that's a conversation that I have with people uh, eagerly and willingly. It, so, you know, it, it's it's not like, you know, I'm not like uh, on an arena stage and nobody, you know, can, yeah. people kind of see me up on the Jumbotron and that's it. You know, like I am a very approachable kind of person and yeah. an artist and still... There is, there is part of like the persona that you put, you have to have a persona that you put out there. It can't just be a hundred percent you because it's very vulnerable and 
it's, it's, you need, you need to keep a little bit back for yourself. And my persona was very natural and open, but you know, I did, it, it was not all of me. Yeah. And, um, the sharing this with my fans felt like a big chunk of what I had reserved for myself, which is, you know, my personal, my personal health. I didn't talk about that very much, you know, yeah. and now, and also it was affecting my mental health. So, mm-hmm. you know, talking about that was revealing a lot more than I was initially comfortable with. But, um, again, it was in the art and it was going to change how I toured and what gigs I could get to. And so I was like, you're going to have to talk about this at some point. You might as well just rip the bandaid off and be honest now. And I did that in the, in the context of the Kickstarter and, you know, people showed an amazing amount of kindness that, yeah. you know, I don't know how I'll ever repay other than just to make the best record that I could possibly make. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. You know, and, I think that's you use the word tangible and like yeah that's definitely tangible evidence that you have support is you know meeting that in 12 hours but yeah it's like before that tangible kind of evidence exists you're talking about you know mental health and how your how your brain kind of at least I'll speak personally my brain would used to spiral I would be at my desk working uh, on a video at like a small advertising agency and, and in my out of nowhere my brain would be like you can't do this forever you know yeah. and then and then I'm like and then it's like you're not going to be able to drive forever you know and then it's like then it's like no one's going to want to marry you and then you it's just like one thing after another these like and it's like yeah. creates this spiral of like negativity and and I've kind of learned that like the more I put myself out there you know and meet people you know, through my podcast and the more I tell people close to me, because, you know, even when I was 27, I didn't tell anyone, like I didn't even tell my, my, uh, I would go to job interviews and just not bring it up because I I didn't want them to not hire me and things like that. But the more I became open, you know, I'll use the word transparent just to kind of use that buzzword I use here on the the podcast here. But I felt this huge relief and weight off my back. Um, and uh, it sounds like you're kind of going through something similar where you had this diagnosis and it created this huge weight, you know, and I'm not saying that my weight's not gone. There's still a lot of weight on my back, sure. but, but like the more you kind of put yourself out there and open up to those around you, you kind of start to realize, okay, okay, okay. It's not all that spiral is a little exaggerated, you know? And uh, yeah. you start to feel a little more comfortable, and and and, uh, and I think that it just takes work. It takes work, just like you know, you t- you mentioned therapy. It's like, you know, that's work. You know, there's, it just takes work. You know, I guess is you know all I can say. It's yeah, not easy. To, to hold yourself accountable, right? Yeah. And and uh, for your mindset, for the way that you express your emotions, and you know, I. I have kids, so, you know, I have two boys, uh, yeah. f- 15 and, and 12. So, you know, for me, there's always somebody watching me, you know. <laughs> um, they're looking at how I handle this. Yeah. And um, they were, you know, they're looking, I would assume, forward to many more years, they're almost their entire life ahead of them with their father. You know, I can't be, if I'm lost in, in that kind of catastrophic spiral, um, I can't be there for them. Yes. Um, so, you know, for me that I, I was, I felt lucky that I had that, you know, if I was Mm -hmm. a younger person, I didn't have, I mean, you got a, you got a wife, so there's that, you know, she can, she can, serve that role, uh, in your life where you got to be accountable to this person. You can't, you don't really have the luxury of falling apart because yeah. there's people that need you, you know, and the world needs you, you know, <laughs> like they need, we need everybody to kind of bring their, their best self here. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's not a, as you know, it's not a, uh, step by, or it's not a, a one way kind of like, easy thing to do, you know, like there's some days you 
take a couple steps forward and you feel like you did some really, really good work. And then other days you took a, a few steps back and you're like, I didn't handle that very well. Yeah. Um, and you know, hopefully eventually you get a little bit closer. Um, I'm not sure you ever get, get, there to that like state of enlightenment or whatever we're, yeah. whatever you want to call it but you just try and get as clo- closer and closer to it you know w- whatever you're trying to mm-hmm. carry with you you know in our case it's rp but other people are trying to carry other things and, and live their lives with that yeah i agree i think you know that inner voice you know it can be your best friend some days but sometimes it can be you know that little i sometimes i say like rp it's like a little devil on your shoulder sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Whispering these little anxiety kind of inducing thoughts into your head. Yeah. Um, and then, Absolutely. and then you need, sometimes you, you need, uh, reminders from outside sources, you know, like your friends and family to kind of put you back in reality sometimes. Yeah. I put mine in my songs a lot too. Yeah. You know, I mean, I come off you know, pretty well in these songs, you know, like, oh, he's a very compassionate, you know, emotionally aware dude, you know, and yes, I am, but I'm not, I'm not as good as the guy in my songs, Mm. you know, I'm, I'm more human than he is, but I put those things in the songs to try and remind myself that this is one way that you can be if you choose that every day, you know? And uh, I mean, that's the, the title of the record, you know, lay your darkness down comes from that song. And the, and, um, there's that line in, in the song where it's like, you know, shadows lie upon the ground to show you where the light is coming from. Lay your darkness down, shadows lie upon the ground to show us where the light is coming from. Yeah. It's like. You need the shadows. It's a great line. It's yeah that 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 imagery. You know, I I can't take full credit from that. That came out in the course of a conversation with uh, a friend of mine, a, a fellow songwriter and producer named Joe Henry. But it really struck me deeply, and I went and you know wrote a mm-hmm. whole song around it. But it's it's that thing where you you always have to be looking for the light, and the darkness can kind of show you where it's coming from. Yeah. You're not there where the light is, but you know where, you know, in what direction it is and you can kind of orient your spirit in that direction. And, you know, I guess some people would, that's like the definition of hope really Yeah. for, for, for some folks and myself. And so I, I put these reminders to myself in my songs. They're like Easter eggs, you know, (laughs) in my own personal DVD. And it's like, Oh yeah. Remember that thing you said? Yeah. It's true. And you should live, your life like you actually believe it, you know? Yeah. And some days I, I get there. <laughs> yeah, I relate to that a lot, you know, expressing yourself, you know, via your art and <clears throat> you you have a persona, artistic persona, but but it's also a reflection of who you are, you know, and and you know, not many people put their put themselves out there so openly as artists do, you know, and because it, it, to me, like good art requires it. I know art is subjective, but my personal favorite type of art is, you know, when people are opening up and there's a little bit of vulnerability present, you know? Um, and there's a lot of that in the, in your new album. Um, and I, I feel like uh, your fans are going to be really excited and I feel like you're going to get a lot of new fans, um, from it. That would be amazing. I mean, you always hope that for any, any record, you know, I mean, these, these are, I do make them for myself. Um, but I, I want them. uh, The process is really for myself. It's cathartic. I bet. Yeah. Yeah. The process is really for me. Yeah. The end result is not for me. The end result. I want everyone to hear. I, Mm -hmm. you know, I don't want it to be anyone's best kept secret. I want the whole world to hear it, but the process is mine. And, um, that's, you know, for this record that it was a particularly arduous, you know, process as much for the way that I did it as, as the mindset that I was in when I was, when I was doing it. But I think what I realized recently is that, you know, I made 12 records that I wanted to make. Mm -hmm. I always made the kind of record that I wanted to make. I never had to do, no one ever told me to do something and I had to do it because they were, you know, yeah 
holding the money or whatever. Like I've done everything I've done. I did it because I wanted to do it. This record is maybe the first record I've ever made because I needed to do it. Mm. And I needed to do it in this way. Um, so to me, this record feels like the something that needed to happen so that whatever is on the other side can can come can come out you know yeah if i had let these songs and the emotions that fueled these songs kind of if i tried to keep them inside i would have never i i would never move past that you know it would just it would have blocked me like literally yeah so now that i've made this record in this way it frees me up a little frees bit. Frees you up, yeah. Keep doing the things that I want to do, knowing that because of my RP, I might have to do it slightly differently than I used yeah. to. But, um, you know, I, I you might to make this record. You might write a song, you know, 15 years from now about RP, and it might have a completely different, you know, vibe to it, you know? Oh, totally. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, even even my old stuff now has a completely different vibe to it. The yeah. record before this one was called Blindsided. Mm. I mean, hello. <laughs> I had no idea, yeah. you know, when I wrote that record and I was talking about, you know, being blindsided in a comp by in a completely different way. Yeah. But, you know, the like every it, it colors the art moving forward, but it also kind of casts a little bit of a shadow on the art going back. Like, yeah. Oh, how do I interpret you know, some of these songs I wrote before I, my diagnosis, including the title track. Yeah. And then, you know, that title track I wrote, uh, you know, it was inspired in, at least in part by the death of uh, Justin Towns Earl, mm -hmm. a fellow songwriter that I didn't know, but his passing affected me greatly. And I used some of his song lyrics in the, in the song. So the, in the chorus there, it says, you had your mama's eyes, but you were your father's son yeah and uh, his father Steve Earl uh, the singer songwriter and you know to me it was very specifically about Justin but then when I got diagnosed I realized well my mom has RP I have my mom's eyes yeah you know and my mom doesn't know who Justin Towns Earl is when she <laughs> heard that song she thought it was about her <laughs> yeah you know so it's uh even stuff that happened before the diagnosis you know can kind of be viewed through that lens yeah. uh, in kind of interesting ways. Yeah, that, that is very, very interesting, you know, how you you named your album Blindside and, and kind of had these <clears throat> moments of alignment of lyrics that kind of connect to RP. And I think, like I said, as, as the more time goes on, you're going to start probably connecting even more dots with, with this and that and that yeah. and this and how much it shaped your perspective and... Uh, you know, like I find myself being more, uh, if I see a beautiful imagery in front of me, if I'm somewhere, you know, I, I find myself intentionally kind of soaking it in more, you know. You linger, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so you're already Absolutely. observant because you're a songwriter and you, you have to be, <laughs> but now you're like, I have to be even more observant, you know, so. Uh, yeah. I thought I was observant before, but yeah. I'm, I'm pretty focused on it now. Yeah. For me, like. The light in the sky is a big thing yeah. now, whether it's when it's leaving the sky and when it's coming back into the sky in the morning. I find both of those things very beautiful and and I, I find myself focusing intensely on it mm -hmm. and feeling very different things depending on what time of day it is. Yeah. You know? my, my, emotionally, I'm in a very different state when the light is leaving the sky than in the morning when the light is bleeding back into the sky and the day is kind of full of possibility, you know? Um, but I dwell upon that kind of stuff a lot. And I try to think about that when I'm looking at my wife and when I'm interacting with my kids, like yeah. pay attention. You know, one of the songs on the record is you're going to want to remember this, mm -hmm. you know? And that's like, uh, that was something someone said to me before I was diagnosed or anything, you know, it was just at my 40th birthday party. Yeah. And, uh, you know, she said, you're going to want to remember this. And she was right. And it's so true. Like, and I try and live that way now. Like anytime I experience something or see something, it's like really, really see it. Don't just gloss over it because you're going to, someday you're going to want to, you know, you're going to want to see things and you may not be able to in quite the same way. Yeah. Very well said. And, uh, 
that's another great song on, you know, Lay Your Darkness Down out February 3rd. And by the time this episode's out, you'll be on tour. Uh, oh, I can't wait. Um, so uh, definitely check out and see if Mark's coming through a uh, city near you. Uh, it's a winter tour that's running through March, yeah. right into March. Yeah, March, kind of March, April, May, and and I'll I'll be down in New York City, man. We got to get you out to the show. We got to meet in in uh, in real life. Yes, yeah, that'll happen say. for sure. <laughs> yeah, in IRL, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll definitely come out to a show. I missed you last time you were here, and I I was bummed about it. But yeah, I definitely want to catch your live set. Um, and uh, where can people uh, listen to your music? Well, as of the nature of streaming uh, services now, the way people listen, you know, they, they already have all of it. They just don't know it. <laughs> they just, uh, any any uh, digital streaming platform, Spotify, Apple Music, um, whatever, however you get your music online, um, I'm there. Uh, and um, if people want to support it a little more tangibly and a little more, um, a little more deeply, um there's uh you can go to my website uh and there's a you know i have a store on there and they can buy cds and vinyls and yeah. downloads and all sorts of stuff um but uh yeah marcarelli.com is is really the the best place to uh to go for all that stuff great yeah and i'll have links in the you know episode description for um all that and uh yeah man i, I really enjoyed this conversation um me too it's been a we covered a lot of ground and uh, we could have probably covered a lot more, but you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe that's for another conversation. You know? Volume two. Volume two. <laughs> Take care, man. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you. <laughs>